Dave Neary. My name is Dave Neary. I work for Red Hat in the open source and standards team, which is a relatively recent team in Red Hat, which is a surprise for many. Um, and what we do is we help our open source projects be excellent, right? whatever that means for the projects in question. And um, being Red Hat, we have quite a number of projects in the cloud. And one of the things that I've noticed is that In recent years, the nature of open source communities has begun to change. So that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. I need a third hand. Anyone have one handy? So excuse me for walking around. I ran Santa Yon. This is a picture, actually, from last weekend. Thank you very much. Uh, 70 kilometers from Saint Etienne to Lyon, uh, through up to 30 centimeters of snow and ice. And the Bois de Feuille. It was um, uh, an excellent experience, so I'm still a little bit recovering from it. So uh, I'm just telling you now, I was boasting, right, really, because it's four days later, so all of the all of the bobos are gone. Um, and at least now I know that if I have to run 70 kilometers in nine hours, I can do it, right? If I have to save somebody's life, so I guess it's the control freak in me that wants to prove that that's possible. Uh, anyway, that's not why you're here to hear me talk. I, I'm going to talk about the cloud. So, cloud, 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 You can get the feeling that, that if you listen to the tech press these days, that cloud is everywhere, cloud is everything, everything's about the cloud, 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 cloud is the new buzzword. And um, clouds are kind of the new hops. Clouds are where everything's at. And um, all of the clouds, of course, work on, on Linux. So one of the themes that I'm going to be, you're going to see recurring through this, this, uh, this talk today is, is bad predictions. Um, so the first one, let's get started. This is uh, Andy Tannenbaum, author of Minix and uh, uh, the operating systems book that many computer science study worldwide. Uh, said to Linus Torvalds in 1991, be thankful you're not my student. You would not get a high grade for such a design, making a, a, a monolithic kernel uh, in, to, in 1991 is, is uh, idiocy. Everybody is going to be running 600 megahertz MIPS with GNU Herd in five years. Um, okay, now Linux, now Linux is everywhere. Linux is on all of the clouds. Um, over half of the, the smartphones in the world are running Linux on Android. So, so we've won, right? Yay, freedom. The battle is over. We can go home. We lost by winning. And, and yet, Okay, bad prediction number two. Uh, Thomas Watson Jr., founder and uh, early president of IBM, uh, actually didn't, probably, but has been attributed as saying in 1943 that there's maybe a world market for five computers. Um, which, ha ha ha, this is, this is idiocy these days. And yet, maybe he was right, and those computers are just called Google and Amazon and Facebook and maybe HP, which we're going to hear from later, uh, and maybe some other one. Uh, because as we go to the cloud, we're seeing this concentration with Amazon Web Services. We're seeing this concentration of power in a small number of players. Um, everything is in the cloud these days. Right? So, so starting with infrastructure, you don't need to buy computers anymore because you can now just get uh, virtual hardware uh, from your ISP or from, from uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon Web Services and install whatever operating system you want on it. Storage, uh, if you think about Dropbox, uh, Ubuntu One, Sparkle Share, in terms of the, the open source version, versions, but also in terms of uh, uh, Amazon's S3, uh, is that right? S3? Yeah. Um, Gluster, Ceph, storage is becoming virtualized and networked and scalable and all of the rest of it. Um, Platform, 
We don't have to worry even about installing an operating system anymore. We get the operating system with all of the application stack on it, and we just have to worry about our little bit, bit on the top. And of course, applications, all of the applications that we use every day, whether they're, we may not think of them as applications, we may think of them as websites, but whether it's, it's Gmail, Google Talk, or Facebook, or uh, Trello, or whatever, whatever web applications you, you use, um, they're all in the cloud, right? They're, nothing is local. So, question for me is, what happens if they don't like, if, if you don't like the way they work? What happens if uh, your, the, your email client has a feature that you'd like to fix or add? If your email client is Gmail, isn't that a problem? What happens if something breaks, right? If, um, if my car breaks down, I can open up the hood and go in and, and try and fix it, or get a mechanic to come and try and fix it. If my car is a virtual car in the cloud, and I just get the steering wheel, I'm SOL. That's an acronym that means uh, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the French version for shit out of luck. Anyway, I'm shit out of luck. So, um, cloud and web services, you know, the, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not we, we have lost, in some sense, with all of these proprietary web services, we've lost our freedom. But, 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 I hear you say, we have a GPL, we have a way to promote people to have their web applications free so that users can get the code source for that web application. But, um, so here's what Google's computer looks like. How many of those do you have at home? This is, uh, the cost of running a cloud service and a data center, the cost of uh, virtualizing infrastructure, the cost of virtualizing network um, is very high. Like in, in Overt, Overt is a project that I'm working with uh, for Red Hat, we, we virtualize networks, right? That's what we do is you've got, you've got N computers, you want to run N virtual machines on your N computers, and we have this management console that allows you to do that. Um, it's only useful when you have three machines, right? You've got one manager managing two nodes. That's, that's the minimum where it's actually providing useful functionality. If you only have one computer that you want to run virtual machines on, well then there are, there are easier ways to do that. It's possible with Overt. It's certainly possible to try it out and have a look at how it looks, but, but it's not useful. So to run all of this cloudy stuff, you need infrastructure, you need computers, you need uh, cooling, you need bandwidth. And all of that stuff costs money. And as private citizens, as users of these services, we don't necessarily have access to that. And it shows in our communities. When you look, the further up the cloud you go, the more the open source communities, while they are very, very definitely places where cooperation ha happens, it's cooperation between companies, between corporate players and universities research labs. But um, what, the, what the French call uh, morale, person, person morale. Uh, physical people, we, we just, we're, we're not operating on the same scale. If you go to open stack, cloud stack, over, these are all over 90% uh, corporate contributions. I, uh, it's probably 100% for, for all three of these projects, they're very close to it. Uh, when you get down lower in the stack, Linux is 75% of the contributors to the Linux kernel are paid to do it. I don't know about you, but that kind of worries me. When you get lower in the stack, LibreOffice has more than 50% of its contributions coming from volunteers. GNOME is about 40% paid, 60% volunteers these days. So we're seeing a situation where when we get to a level where we're at a human scale and we can actually affect change in the software and see that change in our own computers, then we're getting more volunteers, we're getting, we're getting more people trying to control their own environment. But when we're talking about cloud software or web services uh, that are hosted, the barrier to running that software on your own means that you actually don't have control over it. In fact, the value in hosted services is in the network. It's in the, the social network, it's in the data that you are using in that, uh, 
in that environment. The value is not on your local computer. It's not in the software. It's what the software does to the data passing through it. We heard this yesterday. So, what freedoms do we have as users running web services? Read. So, next, potentially inaccurately attributed quote, but uh, Bill Gates may or may not have said in 1981 that 640k of memory is enough for everyone. Of course, he was referring to the architecture limit of uh, 640k pages in the x86 architecture. Can you correct me if I'm wrong here? 16-bit DOS. 16-bit DOS, yeah. So, uh, so he said, yeah, okay, maybe the, the, the memory space limit is 640k, but that should be enough for anyone. Uh, in 1981, that seemed realistic. Anyway, nowadays, my phone has 512 megs of memory. I don't have, even have it with me. Um, the computing world is changing. The way we use our computers is changing. Uh, this is what the computer of the future looks like. It's touch screen, small form factor. Uh, it's a phone or a tablet. Right? Even laptop computers are on the way out. Okay, uh, still, sales are still going up, but, but uh, uh, they're on the way out, very distinctly. Uh, desktop computers are basically not cool anymore. Right? Who wants a screen when you can have a laptop? Um, Google also tells us that the, this is the future of the computer. It's going to be tablet, smaller tablet, phone. Right? That's, that's what we have. And in essence, what we have with these is we have dumb terminals. And we saw this in Tristan, Tristan, Tristan Nito's talk yesterday. We've got very smart, very, very computationally um, able, capable, dumb terminals with which we access our web applications. They are useful for cons consumption. They're not useful for creation. Without a keyboard, you can't really program. Uh, we're also moving into the era of ubiquitous computing. I gave a talk on this at last year's FOSSA. And one of the dangers that I identified is when computers get so small that you don't notice them, um, how, can you, how can you change their behavior? Right, so ways is a, a navigation application. It's a GPL client application. Uh, but all of the value in, of, of Waze is in the data. And if you're running a GPS, and it's got, even if it's got a GPL application in it, and you can't modify it, what do I care that it's GPL if I don't have a way to put it on the device? Um, so this is a, yeah, my presentation from last year. And one of the dangers that I identify here is that uh, we don't have control over the computing, the, 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 the software that's in, the, in these, these, these embedded devices. Okay, so GPL v3, Article 6, has an article in there which is meant to mitigate uh, the effect of this uh, to allow users who are using free software on embedded devices uh, to be able to modify software. It says, if you convey the object code uh, work under this section, uh, the corresponding source conveyed under this section must be accompanied by the installation information. And the installation information includes any programs which you need to install that information. In other words, if you as a company reserve the right to update over the wire, for example, firmware on a phone, then you must also give your users the opportunity to update the firmware on the phone themselves and all of the tools they need to do that. Uh, this is a very controversial clause in the GPL. And in fact, a lot of the embedded companies have said, uh, we will never use GPL v3 in our embedded devices or in our phones uh, because of this clause. Uh, even though there, is, there, is load, there are loads of provisos in there. There's a proviso that says uh, you don't have to provide a warranty. Uh, if uh, somebody updates information and updates the source code to make the, be the device behave in a way which is illegal, uh, then that's their problem, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, 
But honestly, the cell phone companies uh, think this is very dangerous. And so uh, most of them are, are on record as saying, no, we will not ever use GPLv3 software. Now, is, uh, is, is it Dan, the standard guy? Ooh. Uh, has that changed? Have you seen people uh, have a, a light, slightly more nuanced approach to GPLv3 in the mobile environment these days? Well, I'm not mobile. Okay, not mobile, don't care. That's fine too. Uh, so what we've got is, we've got uh, the mobile companies, we, we got this in the GPLv3, which was intended to give you, as a user of the software, your freedom. Uh, and we've got the mobile companies rejecting that completely. We've got the devices that are completely locked down. Okay, and, and right, my, I, I've got a phone, it's got Android on it, it's Linux. Right, great, woohoo, it's free software. But, let's be frank, as long as I cannot modify, for example, the way Gmail works on my Android phone and update the firmware of my Android phone to get that new Gmail, the phone is not, in any meaningful sense of the word, running free software. Now, of course, we have Cyanogen mod, right? If I want to run through my battery twice as fast and if I want to lose access to half of the devices, I can use Cyanogen mod on my phone. Um, but the Android that you get from Google, the Android that you get on your Samsung phone, your Nexus One, your HTC phone, whatever you're running. Um, that Android is not free software. And it's actually getting uh, further and further from free software because uh, Google are now using the delayed uh, free mechanism. They're releasing the, the newer versions of the firmware uh, as binary blobs and then only giving you the source code uh, to uh, the free software bits. Uh, six months later. And to use uh, legal talk here, what you get in an Android phone is an aggregate work. It is a bundle of different works. Some of them are free software and some of them are not. So in fact, in practice, uh, all of the Android phones on the market, to my knowledge, are not running a free software operating system. You cannot change the way your phone behaves. So what we've got is we've got a system of learned helplessness. Uh, this is the phrase that uh, uh, Tristan Ito again talked about this yesterday. He talked about how we're, we're teaching people that they cannot influence their computing environments. Uh, learned helplessness is a phrase that's, phrase that's used by psychologists to describe, um, to describe something that they observed where when you subject people to repeated trauma or to repeated uh, uh, situations where they feel like they have no control. Um, eventually they give up trying to escape the balance. It's for example for women who are being beaten at home. Uh, eventually they say, well why didn't you just leave? I couldn't get away. Did you try? I couldn't there was no point in trying. I tried so often and it didn't work. I couldn't get away. You become, at some point, so anesthetized to this repeated uh, helplessness that, that you stop trying. You, you give up and you throw your arms up in despair. And when your Windows machine crashes once more, you say, ah, there's nothing I can do about it. And we are teaching our users we're teaching uh, everybody, uh, for the last five, ten years, we're teaching them that they do not have any power over their computing environment. In spite of the fact that it's running free software. So am I running, fa falling foul of, uh, what's, the, what's the theorem, Godwin's theorem here? Uh, Adolf Hitler said that the best way to take control over a people and control them utterly is to take a little of their freedom at a time, to erode their rights by a thousand tiny and almost imperceptible reductions. I think that's what we've seen in the move to the cloud and the move to mobile computing. Even if all of this stuff is running free software underneath, we as individual users have lost control of our computing environment. So should we give up hope? Is that the end of it? Or is there a little bit of a, a light at the end of the tunnel?
So I think there is. And, and I think we, we, we do not, we should not go boldly into this, uh, do not go boldly into this good night, uh, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Um, I think we should fight back. And we do have some weapons to fight back. For a start, who said that web services have to be centralized? We've already seen some services like Identica, status.net, um, uh, Diaspora, which have shown that social networking federated is possible. Uh, Mark Outward sitting here, sitting here in the front said, uh, the successful free software web services will not look like Facebook, they will look like email to me the day before yesterday. Email has decentralized the delivery of mail. DNS works in the same way. Uh, TCP IP, I believe, works in the same way. By decentralizing the control and by allowing us to federate things by querying the network, having information which is um, replicated across network nodes, we can have social, we, we can have social networks which, which don't depend on a central entity and which give us as individuals the, the power to control part of that network and to change the way the network works collectively. And we've got devices that allow us to do that. The Pirate Box or the Freedom Box are two very interesting projects to run small, low-power devices that allow you to share files, that allow you to, um, that, that, can, uh, that allow us the possibility of creating, in the very near future, a meshed network of devices which will potentially cover uh, the world. Uh, Mark, again, told me about a very interesting experience I think I'm not allowed to talk about, but um, he didn't, I didn't sign any NDA, did I? No. So we can, uh, we can, we can uh, create with these mesh to devices, the OLPC has done this as well, is when you get two OLPC computers that are close to each other, they're using, um, uh, what's the name of the, the, hmm? Yeah, yeah, the ad hoc networking. What's the name of the, the, the Wi-Fi? It's 802.11G or H or whatever, right? the, one of those letters. Um, and and the, you, you got create, you've, you're creating ad hoc mesh networking. You don't need the central node to tell you that you're on a network. Um, devices like uh, the Raspberry Pi, the BeagleBone, are giving us free and open hardware that we can hack on, that we can see what we can do. Uh, we, can, uh, we have power to change. Uh, devices like the, um, the little boards, the Arduinos, where you've got the specs, are completely available. You can buy the bits in fries if you're in the US and make one yourself. Uh, you can make them in any shape or form. Uh, I've, I've, a friend of mine uh, made a daisy chain one, which, was, which he stitched into a, um, a t-shirt. And he showed, he, he had an email indicator telling him how many emails he had available. <laughs> new emails he'd received in binary on his t-shirt. They were lighting up LED. Uh, all of these things are allowing us to control our environment again. We've got open platforms. We saw Firefox OS yesterday giving us tools that we can, we can actually go in and change the way the platform works, whether it's with Firefox OS in a very high-level way with CSS style sheets or a low-level way by going in and changing the code. Uh, we've got platforms like Migo and now Tizen which are built on completely open source components, and we're seeing people pulling those in strange and unexpected directions. And I mentioned cyanogen mod already. And the great thing about free software is that whatever we think is true, whatever we think people will find our stuff to be useful for, they end up finding other ways to use it. So you see, here we've got t-shirts that have been turned into little tote bags. Right, very simple, you just take scissors, you cut it, you, you, you stitch the hem, and, uh, and you got a tote bag out of an old t-shirt. Uh, here, this, this guy is insane. He's a French guy who was driving a 2CV, de chevaux, across uh, the Sahara Desert. It broke down in the middle of nowhere, in southern uh, Algeria. And over the course of three weeks, he retooled his 2CV to take the bits that worked and converted it into a bike, a motorbike which he then rode uh, 80 or 90 miles to the nearest town. 
where he got arrested because it wasn't considered roadworthy by the local police, and he had to bring them back to show them the rest of the carcass <laughs> of the car before they would let him leave and uh, bring it back to France. So people will find other ways of using this stuff, right? Maybe OpenStack does need 10 computers or whatever it is, as a minimum, to run OpenStack well. But maybe one component of OpenStack will be useful to uh, one guy at home uh, for, I don't know, federating identity across the internet, right? So, so he says, well, let, let's 10 of us use this particular component of OpenStack and use it in a way that nobody has considered before. Uh, so that's the great thing about open source, and that's what gives me hope in this situation. And of course, whether we're talking about OpenStack or Android or uh, CloudStack or whatever, all of these things are building on the work of thousands and thousands of free software developers. From the Linux kernel through libc to the GNU C compiler, um, all of these components build up kind of the foundations on which all of these projects are building on. And all of those components are small. And we can control all of those. And we've got the power in our desktop computers to make changes to all of these little components. And that means that we control the building blocks. He who controls the building blocks controls, uh, in some sense, the, the interactions further up the stack. Right? The, only, the only choice that Google has is whether or not to use the Linux kernel. Right? Um, they have uh, found that they're at, uh, further, as, uh, for, as they're going on, they have found that the maintenance costs of maintaining their own fork of the Linux kernel is now becoming heavy enough that they are re-engaging with the kernel project and cooperating again. So we do have power because we control those lower level building blocks. And of course, uh, on all of these projects, uh, people will work together when their interests align. Uh, like in a, in a cycling race, I don't know if any of you are cyclists or cycling fans, we are in the Le Pays du Paris Roubaix. So uh, I imagine that there is. But uh, you, you will often, in a cycling race, see competing teams uh, relaying each other because the guy at the front is taking all of the wind and he's working harder than everybody behind him. And so even though we're competing and both all of us want to win the race, for the time being, right now, our interests align. And in the same way, I see that in, in the majority of open source projects, uh, people will work together as long as their interests align. And it's in our interests uh, to, to affect change in, 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 uh, in open source projects that we use. So I, I do believe that as long as we have that power, we will, we will be taken. And as academics, you have a huge power in the future. We can have a future where we are consumers, or we can have a future where we are actors in our digital existence. Um, I believe that the future of technology is code literacy. I believe that we should be teaching uh, children that they can control the environment in which they live. I believe that we, as educators, uh, as parents, we should be working against that learned helplessness, which, which is so easy a trap to fall into. That we should be teaching our children uh, how to code, to teaching our, our children how to take devices apart when we're, when we're done with them. Take it apart, have a look at how it works, try and fix it afterwards. Uh, that's why my favorite ties of Kaplaz, Logo, Lego, sorry, Playmobiles, Meccano, all of the things that teach you that you can make things, that you can take things apart, break them, fix them again, make things that nobody has thought of before. And as educators, we need to be teaching our students how to code. We need to be teaching our students not just how to use Microsoft Word, but how to change the way their computers work. Uh, so I'm going to end with two quotes. Uh, Andrew Jackson, uh, another perhaps said, well actually he did say, but he, he may not have been the first. Eternal vigilance by the people is the price of liberty, and you must pay the price if you wish to secure the blessing. Uh, we will not remain free as users just because Linux is everywhere. It is vital that we are eternally vigilant to ensure that things like DRM, that things like uh, UEFI, that things like uh, locked down devices and the move to the cloud 
are depriving us of our, of our freedoms as, as, as users. And finally, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants by Thomas Jefferson. Um, <coughs> defending our liberty will not be easy, and there will be times when we will have to turn on people who are former friends because they're doing things which are, which are depriving our users, their users of, li of, of, of their liberty, of their freedom. Uh, and we shouldn't shy away from, from calling people out 